Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Welcome to Keys to the Kingdom. I'm Marissa. I hope that you guys are having a wonderful, peaceful, restful Shabbat today. And I apologize. I had to push the, the video out a little bit. Um, my grandmother's celebration of life is tomorrow, and I had to finish up uh, the speech that I had. Um, there was a couple of other things that I was doing. Um, I just got news that her last living son is in intensive care. So, um, I think I just wanted to rest for a little while longer. Just not resting, sleeping, but, um, I was just, you know, getting into the word and getting into different things surrounding God's word. And I just needed time with God this morning. So I, I did that and I just push the video out about an hour. Hopefully that works for you. Um, if not, you can just go watch watch the replay later on. Um, but we are actually finishing up our the Lord is our the Lord is my shepherd study. Um, this is from a shepherd's perspective. This is from a shepherd's look at Psalm 23. So this is part three and um, we're gonna go through three chapters today and then um, Part four will be the last part of this study on the Lord is my shepherd. Um, if you haven't seen the first two, I would go back and watch those. This is basically a shepherd's look at Psalm 23 um, from a shepherd's perspective. And so it's giving us a deeper understanding of what David was saying in this psalm and how the shepherd actually tends to the sheep. Um, so that we see a more intimate, detailed description of how God takes care of us. And so I pray that today God will speak to you either through this study or later on today in any way that he can possibly speak to you and guide you. Um, I pray that God continue to guide you into all truth, his truth. And, um... That you continue um, in your walk with him so that you are um, close in intimacy with Yahuwah the Most High God. So um, as you know, we are going to be doing a book giveaway. So uh, I'm going to be giving away, um, this was the, um, the book that we've been studying. So if you have not already entered your name, let me know in the comments and I will add your name to the list. I will be doing a drawing probably at the end of the video on the next video, which is going to be part four. And I was actually able to get a hold of four copies. So I have four copies to give away. Let me know if you're interested in the comments. If you haven't already, um, if I don't already have your name down, then you'll need to let me know if you are interested in um, being entered into the drawing for the book. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, the chapter that we left off on. Now, just remember, this is just focusing on um, Psalm 23. Shabbat Shalom, Tiffany. So glad you can make it, sweetie. This is just focusing on Psalm 23. So it's taking us through verse by verse and the, 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 the shepherd who wrote this book is expounding on each verse because he can see within each verse more than is explained in the, in the Psalm because he was himself a shepherd and has a better understanding of what David was saying. Um, remember, David was also a shepherd. So even though David is speaking from the perspective of being the sheep and God being the shepherd, David had a great understanding of this because he himself was a shepherd of sheep as well. So um, the next line of the verse in Psalm 23 that we're going to be looking at is, Yea, though I walk through the valley. We all know that verse Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, yada, yada. 
And so this chapter is going to expound on that, on that line. Yea, though I walk through the valley. But from a shepherd's point of view, this statement marks the halfway stage in the psalm. It is as though up to this point, the sheep has been boasting to its unfortunate neighbor across the fence about the excellent care received from its owner on the home ranch throughout the winter and spring. So basically up to this point, the sheep is sort of like, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, you know, and then this is like the midway point of the psalm where um, now it turns to address the shepherd directly. The personal pronouns I and thou enter the conversation and it becomes a most intimate discourse of deep affection. This is natural and normal. The long treks into the high country with their summer range begin here. And left behind are the neglected sheep on the other side of the fence. Their owner knows nothing of the hill country, the mountain meadows to which these sheep will be led. Their summer will be spent on the close com in the close companionship and solitary care of the good shepherd. So you could have had an owner of sheep. Doesn't necessarily mean that the shepherd was the owner. Sometimes the shepherd was a hired was a hired hand to actually shepherd the sheep for the person who owned the sheep. Both in, um, both in Palestine and in our Western sheep ranches, the division of the year is common practice. Most of the efficient sheepmen endeavor to take their flocks into distant ranges during the summer. This often entails long drives. So it's almost like when they're driving the cattle out west, they take them across, you know, across the land. Apparently they did the same thing with the sheep. Um, they entail long drives. The sheep move along slowly, feeding as they go, gradually working their way up the mountains behind the receding snow. But late, by late summer, they are well up to the remote alpine meadows above the timberland. With the approach of autumn, early snow settles on the highest ridges, restlessly forcing the flock to withdraw down to lower elevations. So they go up during the summer, and then when it starts to get cold, they come back down. Finally, towards the end of the year, as fall passes, the sheep are driven home to the ranch headquarters where they spend the winter. So obviously they're not going to be up at the top because it's snowing there. It is this segment of the yearly operations that is described as the last half of the poem. During this time, the flock is entirely alone with the shepherd. They are in intimate contact with him and under the most personal attention day and night. That is why these last verses are couched in such intimate first-person language. And it is well to remember that all of this is done against a dramatic background of wild mountains, rushing rivers, alpine meadows, and high rangelands. So anybody who is familiar with, with living out west or in, you know, next to mountain ranges or even in the Tennessee mountains... Um, Kind of has a better understanding of the backdrop and the scenery that was going on here. Hey, Amber, Shabbat Shalom. So glad you can make it, sweetie. Um, whereas someone like me here in Florida, who was born and raised in Florida. Um, I mean, I can imagine it because I've been to the mountains. But um, this is where you kept a lot of your um, cattle. And this is definitely where you kept sheep. David, the psalmist, of course, knew this type of terrain firsthand. When Samuel was sent of God to anoint him king over Israel, he was not at home with his brothers on the home ranch. Remember they had to go find David? Instead, he was high up on the hills tending his father's flock. They had to send for him to come home. It is no wonder he could write so clearly and consciously of the relationship between a sheep and its owner. He knew from firsthand experience about the 
about all the difficulties and dangers, as well as its delights of the treks into the high country. Again and again, he had gone up into the summer range with his sheep. He knew this wild but wonderful country like the palm of his own strong hand. Never did he take his flock where he had not already been before. Always he had gone ahead to look over the country with care. All the dangers of rampaging rivers and flood, and flood avalanches, rock slides, poisonous plants, the ravages of predators that raid the flock, or the awesome storms of sleet and hail and snow were familiar to him. He had handled his sheep and managed them with care under all these adverse conditions. Nothing took him by surprise. He was fully prepared to safeguard his flock and tend, tend to them with skill under every circumstance. All of this is brought out in the beautiful simplicity of the last verse. Here is a grandeur, a quietness, an assurance that sets the soul at rest. I will not fear, for thou art with me. With me in every situation, in every dark trial, in every dismal disappointment, in every distressing dilemma. In the believer's life, we often speak of wanting to move to higher ground with God. How we long to live above the lowlands of life. We want to go beyond the common crowd, to enter a more intimate walk with God. We speak of mountaintop experiences and envy those who have ascended to the heights and entered into this more sublime sort of life. We often get an erroneous idea about how this takes place. It's as though we imagined we could be airlifted into higher ground. On the rough trail of the believer's life, this is not always so. As with ordinary sheep management, so with God's people, one only gains higher ground by climbing up through the valleys. Every mountain has its valleys. Its sides are scarred by deep ravines and gulches and draws. And the best route to the top is always along these valleys. I'm going to stop right here and just tell you something because I'm almost about to cry. Um, I didn't read these chapters ahead of time. This, uh, the first two I did. The first two videos, I read them ahead of time. I didn't have time this week. There's a lot going on. I'm preparing for my grandmother's celebration of life. Like I said, I got news that my uncle is in intensive care, which is her last living son. And my mind has just been all over the place. I didn't read them. So I literally just said a prayer right before, right before this video. I just prayed to Abba. I just prayed to him. It was an intimate prayer, personal prayer. And this chapter is literally like, literally speaking with very, um, <laughs> with very, uh, deep, in like um intricate detail of what my prayer was before this so it's it's sort of it's sort of catching my breath i have to catch my breath it's catching me off guard i should say um because i didn't read this ahead of time anyways so every mountain has its valleys its sides are scarred by deep ravines and gulches, and the best route to the top is always along these valleys. Any sheepman familiar with the high country knows this. He leads his flock gently, but persistently, upon the paths that, wi that wind through the dark valleys. It should be noticed that the verse states, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It does not say I die there or stop there, but rather I walk through. Thank you. Um, it says I walk through. So don't worry. The valleys, they're, they're here to stay, but you don't stay there. Well, I say they're here to stay. I shouldn't say they're here to stay. 
Um, you're going to go through the valley. You're not going to stay there. They're always going to come back. There will be another valley, but you're not going to stay there. You're going to go through it. It's customary to use this verse as a consolation to those who are passing through the dark valley of death. But even here, for the child of God, death is not an end, but merely the door into a higher, more exalted life of intimate contact with Messiah. Death is but the dark valley opening out into an eternity of delight with God. It's not something to fear, but an experience through which one passes on the path to a more perfect life. The Good Shepherd knows this. It's one reason why he has told us, Lo, I am with you always. Yes, even in the valley of death, he's with us. What a comfort and what a cheer. I was keenly aware of this consolation when my wife went to higher ground. For two years, we had walked through the dark valley of, of death, watching her beautiful body be destroyed by cancer. As death approached, I sat by her bed, her hand in mind, in mine. Gently we passed through the valley of death. Both of us were quietly aware of God's presence, but there was no fear, just a going to a higher ground. This is exactly how I felt when I was holding my grandmother's hand as she was passing. For those of us who remain on earth, there is still a life to live here and now. There are still valleys to walk through during our remaining days. These need not be dead-end streets. The disappointments, the frustrations, the discouragements, the dilemmas, the dark, difficult days, though they be shadowed valleys, need not be disasters. They can be the road to higher ground on our walk with God. After all, when we pause and think about it a moment, we must realize that even our modern mountain highways follow the valleys to reach the summit that passes of the passes they traverse. Similarly, the ways of God lead upward through the valleys of our life. Again and again, I remind myself, oh God, this seems terribly tough, but I know for a fact that in the end, it will prove to be the easiest and gentlest way to get me to higher ground. Then when I thank him for the difficult things, the dark days, I discover that he is there with me in my distress. At that point, my panic, my fear, my misgivings give way to calm and quiet confidence in his care. Somehow in a serene, quiet way, I am assured all will, all will turn out well for my best because he is with me in the valley and things are under his control. To come to this conviction in the believer's life is to have entered into an attitude of quiet acceptance of every adversity. It is to have moved onto higher ground with God. Knowing him in this new and intimate manner makes life much more bearable than before. There is a second reason why sheep are not taken I'm sorry, there's a second reason why sheep are taken to the mountaintops by way of the valleys. Not only is this the way of the gentlest grades, but also it is well-watered route. Here one finds refreshing water all along the way. There are rivers, streams, springs, and quiet pools in the deep defiles. During the summer months, Long drives can be hot and tiresome. The flocks experience intense thirst and how glad they are for the frequent watering places along the valley route where they can be refreshed. I recall one year when an enormous flock of over 10,000 sheep was being taken through our country en route to their summer range. The owners came asking permission to water their sheep at the river that flowed by our ranch. Their thirsty flocks literally ran to the water's edge to quench their burning thirst under the blazing summer sun. Only in our valley 
was their water for their parched flesh. How glad we were to share that water with them. As believers, we will sooner or later discover that it is in the valleys of our lives that we can find refreshment from God himself. It's not until we have walked with him through some very deep troubles that we discover he can lead us to find our refreshment in him right there in the midst of our difficulty. We are thrilled beyond words when there comes restoration to our souls and spirits from his own gracious spirit. During my wife's illness after her death, I could not get over the strength, solace, and serene outlook imparted to me virtually hour after hour by the presence of God's gracious spirit himself. It was as if I was being repeatedly refreshed and restored despite the most desperate circumstances all around me. Unless one had actually gone through an experience, it may seem difficult to believe. In fact, there are those who claim they could not face such a situation. But for a man or woman who walks with God through these valleys, such real and actual refreshment is available. I'm sure you've all experienced this before. The corollary that is this is that one who is that only those who have been through such dark valleys can console, comfort, or encourage others in similar situations. Often we pray or sing the hymn requesting God to make an to make us an inspiration to someone else. We want instinctively to be a channel of blessing to others. The simple fact is that just as water can only flow in a ditch or a channel or a valley, so in the believer's career, the life of God can only flow in blessing through the valleys that have been carved and cut into our own lives by excruciating experiences. For example, the the one best able to comfort another in bereavement is the person who himself has lost a loved one. The one who can best minister to a broken heart is one who has known a broken heart. Most of us do not want valleys in our lives. We shrink from them with a sense of fear and foreboding. Yet in spite of our worst misgivings, God can bring great benefit and lasting benediction to others through these valleys. Let us not always try to avoid the dark things or the distressing days. They may well prove to be the way of greatest refreshment to ourselves and those around us. Now the third reason why the rancher chooses to take his flock to the high country by way of the valleys is that this is generally where the richest feed and best forage is to be found along the route. The flock is moved along gently. They are not hurried. There are lambs along which have never been this way before. So the babies, you know, the, the younger lambs. The shepherd wants to be sure that there will not only be water, but also the best grazing available for the ooze and their lambs. Generally, the choicest meadows are in these valleys along the stream banks. Here the sheep can feed as they move towards high country. Naturally, these grassy glades are often on the floor of steep wall canyons and gulches. There may be, there may be towering cliffs above them on either side. The valley floor itself may be in dark shadow with the sun seldom reaching the bottom except for a few hours at noon. The shepherd knows from past experience that predators like coyotes, bears, wolves, or cougars can take cover in these broken cliffs and from their vantage point prey on the flock. He knows these valleys can be subject to sudden storms and flash floods that send walls of water rampaging down the slopes. There could be rock slides, mud or snow av avalanches, and a dozen other natural disasters that would destroy or injure his sheep. But in spite of such hazards, he also knows that this is still the best way to take his flock to the high country. He spares himself no pains or troubles or time 
to keep an eye out for any danger that might develop. One of the most terrible threats is the sudden chilling storms of sleet, rain, and snow that can sweep down through the valleys from the mountain peaks. If sheep become soaked and chilled with a freezing rain, the exposure can kill them in a very short time. They're very thin-skinned creatures, easily susceptible to colds, pneumonia, and other respiratory complications. I recall one storm I went through in the foothills of the Rockies in the early summer. The morning had been bright and clear. Suddenly, around noon, enormous dark black forbidding clouds began to sweep down over the hills from the north. Hold on one second. Okay. A chilling wind accompanied an approaching storm. The sky grew blacker by the hour. Suddenly, in mid-afternoon, along streams, streamers of rain and sleet began to sweep down across the valley. Now, I ran in to take shelter in a clump of studded and windblown spruce. The rain soaked me through. As it fell, it cooled the whole country. The rain turned to sleet, then commingled snow and hail, and then in a short time, the whole mountain slope in mid-July, was white and frozen. Omnious darkness shrouded the whole scene. The sheep sensed the storm approaching, and perhaps the flocks would have perished if they had not raced away to find shelter in the steep cliffs at the edge of the canyon. But in these valleys was where the grass grew best, and it was the route to the high country. Our shepherd knows all of this when he leads us through dark valleys. He knows where he can find strength, where we can find strength and sustenance and gentle grazing despite every threat of disaster about us. It is a most reassuring and reinforcing experience to the child of God to discover that there is even in the dark valley, a source of strength and courage to be found in God. It is when he can look back over life and see how the shepherd's hand has guided and sustained him in the darkest hours that renewed faith is engendered. I know of nothing with so, which so stimulates my faith in my heavenly father as to look back and reflect on his faithfulness to me in every crisis and every chilling circumstance of my life. Over and over, he has proved his care and concern for my welfare. Again and again, I have been conscious of the Good Shepherd's guidance through dark days and deep valleys. All of this multiplies my confidence in Messiah. It is this spiritual as well as emotional and mental exposure to the storms and adversaries of life that puts stamina into my very being. Because he has led me through without fear before, he can do it again and again and again. In this knowledge, fear fades and tranquility of heart and mind takes place. Let come what may. Storms may break about me, predators may attack, the rivers of reverses may threaten to inundate me, but because he is in the situation with me, I shall not fear. To live thus is to have taken some very long treks towards the high country of holy, calm, healthy living with God. Only the believer who learns to live this way is able to encourage and inspire the weaker ones around him. Too many of us are shaken up, frightened, and panicked by the storms of life. We claim to have confidence in Messiah, but when the first dark shadow sweeps over us and the path we tread looks gloomy, we go into a deep slump of despair. Sometimes we just feel like laying down to die, and this is not how it should be. The person with a powerful confidence in Messiah and the one who has proved by past experience that God is with him in adversity. The one who walks through life's dark valleys without fear, his head held high, 
is the one who in turn is a tower of strength and a source of inspiration to his companions. There are going to be some dark valleys in life for us all. The good shepherd himself assured us that in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. It's John 16, 33. The basic question is not whether we have many or few valleys. It is not whether those valleys are dark or merely dim with shadows. The question is, how do I react to them? How do I go through them? How do I cope with the calamities that come my way? When, well, with Messiah, I face them calmly. With his gracious spirit I guide, he, to guide me, I face them fearlessly. I know of a surety that only through them can I possibly travel to higher ground with God. In this way, not only shall I be blessed, but in turn, I will become a benediction to others around me who may live in fear. I think that was one of my favorite ones. That was so beautiful. Whew. Okay. Now this next chapter is focusing on the verse in Psalm 23 that says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now when the shepherd is afield with his flock in the high country, it is customary for him to carry a minimum of equipment. This is especially true in olden times where, where the sheepmen did not have the benefit of mechanized equipment to transport camp supplies across the rough country. Even today, the so-called shepherd shacks or cabooses in which the herder spends his lonely summers with the sheep are equipped with only the barest essentials. But during the hours that he is actually in the field, the sheepman carries only a rifle slung over his shoulder and a long slendered staff in his hand. There will be a small knapsack in which are packed his lunch, a bottle of water, and perhaps a few simple first aid remedies for his flock. In the Middle East, the shepherd carries only a rod and a staff. Some of my most vivid boyhood recollections of are those of watching the African herdsmen shepherding their, their stock with only a long slender stick and a rough knob carry in their hands. These are the common and universal equipment of the primitive sheepmen. Each shepherd boy from the time he first starts to tend his father's flock takes special pride in the selection of a rod and staff exactly suited to his own size and strength. He goes into the bush and selects a young sapling, which is dug from the ground, then is carved and whittled down with great care and patience. The enlarged base of the sapling, where its trunk joins the roots, is shaped into a smooth, rounded head of hard wood. The sapling itself is shaped to exactly fit the owner's hand. After he completes it, the shepherd boy spends hours practicing with this club, learning how to throw it with amazing speed and accuracy. It becomes his main weapon of defense for both himself and the sheep. I used to watch the native lads having competitions to see who would throw his rod with the greatest accuracy across the greatest distance. The effectiveness of, this crude, of these crude clubs in the hands of skilled shepherds was a thrill to watch. The rod was, in fact, an extension of the owner's right arm. It stood as a symbol of his strength, his power, his authority in any serious situation. The rod was what he relied on to safeguard both himself and his flock in danger. And it was, furthermore, the instrument he used to discipline and correct any wayward sheep that insisted on wandering away. There's an interesting sidelight in the word rod, which has crept into the colloquial language of the West. Here, the slang term rod has been applied to handguns, such as pistols and revolvers, which were carried by cowboys and other Western rangemen. 
The connotation is exactly the same as that used in the psalm. The sheep asserts that over the owner's rod, his weapon of power, authority, and defense, is a continuous comfort to him. So all of those things are a comfort to the sheep. For with it, the manager is able to carry out effective control of his flock in every situation. It will be recalled how when God called Moses, the desert shepherd, and sent him to deliver Israel out of Egypt from under Pharaoh's bondage, it was his rod that was to demonstrate the power vested to him. It was always through Moses' rod that miracles were made manifest, not only to convince Pharaoh of Moses' divine commission, but also to reassure the people of Israel. The rod speaks, therefore, of the spoken word, the expressed intent, the extended activity of God's mind and will in dealing with men. It implies the authority of divinity. It carries with it the convicting power and irrefutable impact of thus saith the Lord. Bella, come here. Just as for the sheep of David's day, there was comfort and consolation in seeing the rod in the shepherd's skillful hands. So in our day, there is great assurance in our own hearts as we contemplate the power, veracity, and potent authority vested in God's word. For, in fact, the scriptures are his rod. They are the extension of his mind and his will and intentions to mortal man. Living as we do in an era when numerous confused voices and strange philosophies are presented to people. Boy, is that going on today or what? <clears throat> it is reassuring to the child of God to turn to the word of God and know it to be his shepherd's hand of authority. What a comfort to have this authoritative, clear-cut, powerful instrument under which to conduct ourselves. By it, we are kept from confusion and chaos. A lot of confusion and chaos going on today. This in, itself bring, this in itself brings into our lives a great sense of quiet serenity, which is precisely what the psalmist meant when he said, Thy rod comforts me. There is a second dimension in which the rod is used by the shepherd for the welfare of his sheep, namely that of discipline. If anything, the club is used for this purpose perhaps more than any other thing. I could never get over how often and with what accuracy the African herders would hurl their knob carries at some recalcitrant beast that misbehaved. If the shepherd saw a sheep wandering away on its own or approaching poisonous weeds or getting too close to danger of one sort or the other, the club would go whistling through the air and sent in a wayward, wayward animal scurrying back to the bunch. So basically, you know, they're, you know, getting off the path or going towards something dangerous and they hurl this rod at them and it hits them and they, you know, get back with the rest of the sheep. As has been said of the scripture so often, this book will keep you from sin. It is the word of God that comes swiftly to our hearts, that comes with surprising sadness, suddenness to correct and reprove us when we go astray. It's the spirit of God. It's the spirit of the living God using the living word that convicts our conscience of right conduct. In this way, we are kept under control by Messiah who wants us to walk in the ways of righteousness. Another interesting use of the rod in the shepherd's hand was to examine the count, examine and count the sheep. In the terminology of the Old Testament, this was referred to as passing under the rod. This meant not only coming under the owner's control and authority, but also to be subject to his most careful, intimate and firsthand examination. 
a sheep that passed under the rod was one which had been counted and looked over with great care to make sure all is well with it. Because of their long wool, it is not always easy to detect disease or wounds or defects in sheep. For example, at a sheep show, an inferior, an inferior animal can be clipped and shaped and shown so as to appear as a perfect specimen. But the skilled judge will take his rod and part the sheep's wool to determine the condition of the skin or the cleanliness of the fleece and the conformation of the body. In plain language, one does not just pull the wool over his eyes. In caring for his sheep, the good shepherd, the careful manager, will from time to time make a careful examination of sheep, of individual sheep, of each one. Shabbat Shalom, Crystal! Better late than never. It's okay. You can always go back and watch it. Um, let me see here. The picture is a very poignant one. As each animal comes out of the corral and through the gate, it is stopped by the shepherd's outstretched rod, and he opens the fleece with the rod. He runs his skillful, skillful hand over the body, and he feels for any sign of trouble. He examines the sheep with care to see that all is well. This is a most searching process, entailing every intimate detail. It is also a comfort to the sheep, for only in this way can its hidden problems be laid bare before the shepherd. This is what was meant in Psalm 139, 23 through 24, when the psalmist wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. If we will allow it, if we will submit to it, God, by his word, will search us. There will be no pulling the wool over his eyes. He will get below the surface, behind the front of our old self-life and expose things that need to be made right. This is a process from which we need not shrink. It is not something to avoid. It is not done in concern and compassion, or I should say, I'm sorry, it's done in concern and compassion for our well-being and our welfare. The great shepherd of our souls has our own best interests at heart when he so searches us. What a comfort this should be to the child of God who can trust in God's care. Wool in scripture speaks of the self-life, the self-will, the self-assertion, the self-pride. We talked about that in a previous I think part two, when we talked about why the priests wore linen and not wool, because wool was heavy and it represents pride in the self of person. God has to get below this and do a deep work in our wills to right the wrongs, which are often bothering us beneath the surface. So often we put on a fine front and a brave, bold exterior when really deep down below, there needs to be some remedy applied. Finally, the shepherd's rod is an instrument of protection, both for himself and his sheep when they're in danger. It is used both as a defense and a deterrent against anything that would attack. The skilled shepherd uses his rod to drive off predators like coyotes, wolves, cougars, or stray dogs. Often it is used to beat the brush discouraging snakes and other creatures from disturbing the flock. In extreme cases, such as David recounted to Saul, the psalmist no doubt used his rod to attack the lion and the bear that came to raid his flocks. Because remember, David killed a lion and a bear. Once in Kenya, photographing elephants, I was being accompanied by a young Maasai herder who carried a club in his hand. We came to the crest of a hill from which we could see a herd of elephants in thick bush below us. 
To drive them out into the open, we decided to dislodge a boulder and roll it down the slope. As we heaved and pushed against it, the great rock, against the great rock, a cobra coiled beneath it suddenly came into view ready to strike. In a split second, the alert shepherd, shepherd boy lashed out with his club, killing the snake on the spot. The weapon had never left his hand, even while we worked on the rock. Thy rod comforts me. In that instant, I saw the meaning of this phrase in a new light. It was the rod ever ready in the shepherd's hand that had saved the day for us. It was the rod of God's word that Messiah, our good shepherd, used in his own encounter with that serpent Satan during his desert temptation. It's the same word of God which we can count on again and again to encounter the assaults and attacks of Satan. And it matters not whether the guise he assumes is that of a subtle serpent or a roaring lion that desires to destroy us. There is no substitute for the scriptures in coping with the complexities of our social order. We live in an ever more involved, involved and difficult millennia. We're part of a world of men and women whose code of conduct is contrary to all that Messiah advocated. To live with such people is to be ever exposed to enormous temptations of all sorts. Some are very subtle very smooth. I'm sorry, some people are very subtle, very smooth, very sophisticated. Others are capable of outright violent attacks against the children of God. In every situation and under every circumstance, there is comfort in the knowledge that God's word can meet and master the difficulty if we will rely on it. We turn now to discuss and consider the shepherd's staff. In a sense, that staff, more than any other item in his personal equipment, identifies the shepherd as a shepherd. No one in any other profession carries a shepherd's staff. Sorry. It is uniquely an instrument used for the care and management of sheep. And the only sh and only sheep. It will not do for cattle, horses, or dogs. It is designed, shaped, and adapted especially to the needs of sheep, and it is used only for their benefit. The staff is essentially a symbol of the concern, the compassion that a shepherd has for his charges. No other single word can better describe its function on behalf of the flock than that it is for their comfort. Hold on one second, my dog is crying to get out of the door. Bella, why did you, what, you, you go ahead, go ahead. Go. Sorry, she cries to come in, and then once she's in, she cries to go out. She can't make up her mind. Okay, so, so it's for the flock's comfort. Whereas the rod conveys the concept of authority and power, of discipline, of defense against danger, the word staff speaks of all that is long-suffering and kind. The shepherd's staff is normally a long, slender stick, often with a crook or a hook, just as you would imagine a staff to look like, um, on one end. And it's selected with care by the owner. It's shaped and smoothed and cut to, the be to best suit his own personal use. Some of the most moving memories I carry with me from Africa and the Middle East are of seeing elderly shepherds in the twilight of life, standing silently at sunset, leaning on their staves, watching their flocks with contented spirits. Somehow the staff is of, of special comfort to the shepherd himself. In the tough tramps and during the long weary watches with his sheep, 
he leans on it for support and strength. It becomes to him a most precious comfort and help in his duties. Just as the rod of God is emblematic of the word of God, so the staff of God is symbolic of the spirit of God. In Messiah's dealing with us as individuals, there is the essence of the sweetness, the comfort and consolation, the gentle correction brought about by the work of his gracious spirit. There are three areas of sheep management in which the staff plays a most significant role. The first of these is drawing sheep together in an intimate relationship. The shepherd will use his staff to gently lift a newborn lamb and bring it to its mother if they become separated. He does this because he does not wish to have the ewe reject her offspring if it bears the odor of his hands upon it. I have watched skilled shepherds moving swiftly with their staves amongst thousands of ewes that were lambing simultaneously. With deft but gentle strokes, the newborn lambs are lifted with the staff and placed side by side with their dams. It's a touching sight that can hold one spellbound for hours. But in precisely the same way the staff is used by the shepherd to reach out and catch individual sheep, young or old, and draw them close to himself for intimate examination. The staff is very useful in this way for the shy and timid sheep that normally tend to keep a distance from the shepherd. Similarly, in the believer's life, we find the gracious Holy Spirit, the Comforter, drawing folks together into a warm personal fellowship with one another. It is also he who draws us to Messiah. For as we are told in Revelation, the Spirit and the Bride say come. The staff is also used for guiding sheep. Again and again I have seen a shepherd use his staff to guide his sheep gently onto a new path or through some gate or along dangerous, difficult routes. He does not use it actually to beat the beast. Rather, the tip of the long slender stick is laid gently against the animal's side. And the pressure applied guides the sheep in the way the owner wants it to go. So he just moves it up against the animal. Thus the sheep is reassured of its proper, proper path. Sometimes I have been fascinated to see how a shepherd will actually hold his staff against the side of some sheep that is a special pet or favorite, simply so that they are in touch. They will walk along the way almost as though it were hand in hand. The sheep obviously enjoys this special attention from the shepherd and reveals and, reve and revels in the close, personal, intimate contact between them. To be treated in this special way by the shepherd is to know comfort in a deep dimension. It is a delightful and moving picture. In our walk with God, we are told explicitly by Messiah himself that it would be his Holy Spirit who would be sent to guide us and to lead us into all truth. That is so crazy. I literally just prayed that prayer this morning. Like I said earlier, I didn't read these chapters um, this time ahead of time. I normally read them ahead of time to know what I'm going to be, what we're going to be studying. And I didn't. And I just prayed this long prayer before the video. And like, this is addressing everything in my prayer. Anyways, God is so good. Um, plus, I was praying that, I, I think I prayed it at the beginning of this video on the video, that he would guide you into all truth. John sixteen thirteen. That's the Holy Spirit. This same gracious spirit takes the truth of God, the word of God, and makes it plain to our hearts and minds in spiritual undertaking. It is he who gently and tenderly, but persistently, says to us, this is the way, walk in it. And as we comply and cooperate with his gentle promptings, a sense of safety, comfort, and well-being envelop us. 
It is he, too, who comes quickly, by emphatically, but emphatically, to make the life of Messiah, my shepherd, real and personal and intimate to me. We're talking about the Holy Spirit doing this. Through him, I am in touch with Messiah. There steals over me the keen awareness that I am his and he is mine. The gracious spirit continually brings home to me the acute consciousness that I am God's child and he is my father. In all this, there is enormous comfort and a sublime sense of oneness, of belonging, of being in his care, and hence the object of his special affection. The believer's life is not just one of subscribing to certain doctrines or believing certain facts. Essential as all of this confidence in the scriptures, as, as essential, I'm sorry, let me read that over. Essential as all of this confidence in scriptures may be, there is as well the actual reality of experiencing and knowing firsthand the feel of his touch, the sense of his spirit upon my spirit. There is for the true, the true child of God that intimate, subtle, yet magnificent experience of sensing the comforter at his side. This is not imagination. This is the genuine, bona fide reality of everyday life. This is a calm, quiet repose and the knowledge that he is there to direct even in the most minute details of daily living. He can be relied on to assist us in every decision, and in this there lies tremendous comfort for the, for the believer. Over and over I have turned to him, and in audible, open language asked for his opinion on a problem. I have asked, what would you do in this case? Or I have said, are you here now? You know all the complexities. Tell me precisely what is the best procedure at this point. And the thrilling thing is, he does just that. He actually conveys the mind of Messiah in the matter to my mind. Then the right decisions are made with confidence. It is when I do not do this that I end up in difficulty. It is then that I find myself in a jam of some sort. And here again, the gracious spirit comes to my rescue, just as the shepherd rescues his sheep out of the situations into which our own stupidity leads them. Into which their own stupidity leads them. So it's when we don't consult God, when we don't consult the Holy Spirit, when we don't consult God for direction and we just make a decision, that's when we get into trouble. Being stubborn creatures, sheep often get into the most ridiculous and preposterous dilemmas. I have seen my own sheep greedy for one or more mouthfuls of green grass, climb down steep cliffs where they slipped and fell into the sea. Only my long shepherd's staff could lift them out of the water back onto solid ground again. One winter day, I spent several hours rescuing a ooh, that's a female sheep, that had done this very thing several times before. Her stubbornness was her undoing. I think we can all say that. Another common occurrence was to find sheep stuck fast in labyrinths of wild roses or brambles where they had pushed in to find a few stray mouthfuls of green grass. Soon the thorns were so hooked into their wool that they could not possibly pull free, tug as they might. Only the use of a staff could free them, for them from their entanglement. Now like, likewise with us, many of our jams and impasses are our own making. In stubborn, self-willed, self-assertion, we keep pushing ourselves into a situation where we cannot extricate ourselves. Then in tenderness, compassion, and care, our shepherd comes to us. 
<clears throat> he draws near in tenderness, <clears throat> lifts us by Holy Spirit out of, the, out of the difficulty and dilemma. What patience God has with us. What long suffering and compassion. What forgiveness. Thy staff comforts me. Your spirit, O oh God, is my consolation. Now for the last verse that we're going to look at today is thou preparest a table before me. <clears throat> in thinking about this statement, it is well to bear in mind that the sheep are approaching the high mountain country of the summer ranges. These are known as alp lands or table lands. So much sought after by sheepmen. This is what's up on the high mountain, okay? So this is what this is what they're trying to arrive at as they go through the valleys. In some of the finest sheep country in the world, especially in the western United States and southern Europe, the high plateaus of the sheep ranges are always referred to as mesas, the Spanish word for tables. Oddly enough, the Kiswali, or African word for table, is also mesa. Presumably, this has its origin with the first Portuguese explorers to touch the East African coast. <clears throat> in fact, the use of this word is not uncommon in referring to the high, flat top plateaus of the continent. <clears throat> The classic example, of course, is Table Mountain near Cape Town, which is world-renowned. So it may be seen that what David referred to as a table was actually the entire high summer range. Though these mesas may have been remote and hard to reach, the ener energetic and aggressive sheep owner takes the time and trouble to ready them for the arrival of his flocks. Early in the season, even before all the snow has been melted by spring sunshine, he will go ahead and make preliminary survey trips into this rough, wild country. He will look it over with great care, keeping ever in mind its best use for his flock during the coming season. Then, just before the sheep arrive, he will make another expedition or two to prepare the table land for them. He takes along a supply of salt and minerals to be distributed over the range as strategic spots for the benefit of the sheep during the summer. The intelligent, careful manager will also decide well ahead of time where he camps, where his camps will be located so the sheep have the best grounds. He goes over the range carefully to determine how vigorous the grass and upland vegetation is. At this time, he decides whether some Glades and basins can be used only lightly, whereas other slopes and meadows can be grazed more heavily. He will check to see if there are poisonous weeds appearing, and if so, he will plan his grazing program to avoid them or take drastic steps to eradicate them. Unknown to me, the first sheep ranch I owned had a rather pro prolific native stand of both blue and white campus. Camas, I'm sorry. The blue camas are a delightful sight in the spring when they bloomed along the breaches. The beaches. The breaches. When they bloomed along the, the beaches. The white camas, though a much less conspicu conspicuous flower, were also quite attractive. But a deadly menace to sheep. If lambs in particular ate or even nibbled on a few lily-like leaves, they emerged on the grass sward during the spring and it would spell certain death. The lambs would become paralyzed, stiffed up like blocks of wood, and simply succumb to the toxic poisons from the plants. I did not know this. My youngsters and I spent days and days going over the grounds, plucking out these poisonous plants. 
It was a reoccurring task that was done every spring before the sheep went on these pastures. Though tedious and tiring with all of the bending, it was a case of preparing the table in the presence of my enemies. And if my sheep were to survive, it simply had to be done. A humorous sidelight on this chore was that I was hit I was hit on the idea of making up animal stories to occupy the children's minds as we worked together this way for long hours, often down on our hands and knees. They would become so engrossed in my wild fantasies about bears and skunks and raccoons that the hours passed quite quickly. Sometimes both of them would roll in the grass with laughter as I added realistic action to enliven my, my tales. It was one way to accomplish another, an otherwise terrible routine task. All of this sort of thing was in the back of David's mind as he penned these lines. I can picture him walking slowly over the summer range ahead of his flock. His eagle eye is sharp for any signs of poisonous weeds which he would pluck before his sheep got to them. No doubt he had armfuls to get rid of for the safety of his flock. The parallel in the believer's life is clear. Like sheep, and especially lambs, we somehow feel that we have to try everything that comes our way. We have to try everything that comes our way. We have to taste this thing and that, sampling everything just, just to see what it's like. And we may very well know that some things are deadly and that they can do us no good. They can be most destructive. And still somehow we give them a whirl anyway. To foretell our getting into grief of this sort, we need to remember our master has been there ahead of us, coping with every situation which would otherwise undo us. See, that reminds me of how God says, I go before you. You know how he says throughout the word that he goes before us. That's the perfect way to describe What's happening here with the sheep and the shepherd? The shepherd is going before them to pick out all the weeds that are poisonous to the flock so that they can't eat them. A classic example of this was the incident when Yeshua warned Peter that Satan desired to tempt him and sift him like wheat. But Messiah pointed out that he had prayed that Peter's faith might not fail during the desperate difficulty he would encounter. And so it is even today, our great good shepherd is going ahead of us in every situation, anticipating what danger we may account encounter and praying for us that in it we might not succumb. Another task the attentive shepherd takes on in the summer is to keep an eye out for predators. He will look for signs and spore of wolves, coyotes, cougars, and bears. If these raid or molest the sheep, he will have to hunt them down or go to great pains to trap them so that his flock can rest in peace. Often we act what actually happens is that these crafty ones are up in the rim rock watching every movement that the sheep make, hoping for a chance to make a swift, sneaking attack that will stampede the sheep. Then one of the flock is bound to fall, easily, fall easy prey to the attacker's fierce teeth and claws. The picture here is full of drama, action, suspense, and possible death. Only the alertness of the sheepman who tends the flock on the tableland, in full view of possible enemies, can prevent them from falling prey to attack. It is only his preparation for such an eventuality that can possibly save the sheep from being slaughtered and panicked by their predators. And again, we are given a sublime picture of our Messiah who knows every while, every trick, every treachery of our enemy Satan and his companions. Always we are in danger of attack. 
Scripture sometimes refers to him as a roaring lion who goes about seeking whom he may devour. It's a rather fashionable... It is rather fashionable in some contemporary Christian circles to discredit Satan. There's a tendency to try to write him off or laugh him off as though he were just a joke. Some deny that such a being as Satan even exists. Yet we see evidence of his merciless attacks and carnage in a society where men and women fall prey to his cunning tactics almost every day. We see lives torn and marred and seared by his assaults, though we may never see him personally. It reminds me of my encounters with cougars. On several occasions, these cunning creatures came among my sheep at night, working terrible havoc on the flock. Some ooze were killed outright, their blood drained and livers eaten. Others were torn open and badly clawed. In these cases, the great cats seemed to chase and play with them in their panic like a house cat would chase a mouse. Some had huge pad patches of wool torn from their fleeces. In their frightened stampede, some had stumbled and broken bones or rushed over rough ground, injuring legs and bodies. Yet despite the damage, despite the dead sheep, Despite the injuries and fear instilled in the flock, I never once actually saw a cougar on my range. So cunning and so skillful were their raids that they defy description. At all times they would be wise to walk a lit at all times it would be wise, we would be wise to walk a little closer to Messiah. This is one sure place of safety. It was always the distant sheep, the roamers, the wanderers that were picked off by the predators in an unsuspecting moment. Generally, the attackers are gone before the shepherd is alerted by their cry for help. Some sheep, of course, are utterly, utterly dumb with fear under attack. They will not even give a plaintive bleat before their blood is spilled. In other words, they're not going to make a sound. The same is true of believers. Many of us get into deep difficulty beyond ourselves. We are stricken dumb with apprehension, unable to even call or cry out for help. We just crumble under our adversary's attack. But Messiah is too concerned about us is too concerned about us to allow this to happen. Our shepherd wants to forestall such a calamity. He wants our mountain top, mountain top times to be tranquil interludes. And they will be if we just have the common sense to stay near him where, we can, where he can protect us. Read his word each day. Spend time talking to him. We should give him opportunity to converse with us by his Holy Spirit as we contemplate his life and work for us as our shepherd. There's another chore the sheepman takes care of on the tableland. He clears out the water holes, the springs, the drinking places for his stock. He has to clean out the accumulated debris of leaves, twigs, stones, and soil that have fallen into the water source during the autumn and winter. He may need to repair small earth dams he has made to hold water. And he will open the springs that may have become overgrown with grass and brush and weeds. It is all his work, his preparation of the table for his own sheep in summer. The parallel in the believer's life is that Messiah, our good shepherd, has himself already gone before us into every situation and every extremity that we might encounter. We are told emphatically that he was tempted in all points like we are. We know he entered fully and completely and very 
intimately into the life of men upon our world. He has known our sufferings, experienced our sorrows, and endured our struggles in this life. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Because of this, he understands us. He has totally identified himself with humanity. He has therefore a care and compassion for us beyond our ability to grasp. No wonder he makes every possible provision to ensure that when we have to cope with Satan. Let me read that again. I'm going to, I'm going to back up two lines. Because of this, he understands us. He has totally identified himself with humanity. He has therefore a care and compassion for us beyond our ability to grasp. No wonder he makes every possible provision to ensure that when we have to cope with Satan, sin, or self, the contest will not be one-sided. Rather, we can be sure he has been in that situation before. He is in it now, again, with us. And because of this, the prospects of our preservation are excellent. It is this attitude of rest in him, of confidence in his care, of relaxation as we realize his presence in the picture that can make the believer's life one of calm and quiet confidence. The believer's life, I'm sorry, the believer's walk can thus become a mountaintop experience. A table land trip, simply because we are in the care and control of Messiah, who has been there, been over all this territory before us, and prepared the table for us in plain view of our enemies, who would demoralize and destroy us if they could. It is encouraging to know that just as in any other aspect of life, where there are lights and shadows... So in the believer's life, there are valleys and mountaintops. Too many people assume that once one becomes a believer, automatically life becomes one glorious garden of delight. This is simply not the case. It may well become a garden of sorrow, just as our Savior went through the garden of Gethsemane. 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 As we pointed out previously, you do not have mountaintops without valleys. And even on the mountaintop, there can be some tough experiences. Just because the shepherd has gone ahead and made every possible provision for the safety and welfare of his sheep while they are on the summer range does not mean that they will not have problems there. Predators can still attack. Poisonous weeds can still grow. Storms and gales can still come swirling over the peaks, and a dozen other hazards can haunt the country. Yet in his care and concern for us, concern for us Messiah still ensures us that we shall have some gladness with our sadness, some delightful days as well as dark days, some sunshine as well as shadow. It's not always apparent to us what tremendous personal cost it has been for Messiah to prepare the table for his own. Just as the lonely personal privation of the sheepman who prepares the summer range for his stock entails a sacrifice. So the lonely agony of Gethsemane, of Pilate's Hall, of Calvary have cost my master much. When I come to the Lord's table and partake of the communion service, which is a feast of thanksgiving for his love and care, do I fully appreciate what it has cost him to prepare this table for me? <clears throat> Here we commemorate the greatest and deepest demonstration of true love the world has ever known. For God looked down upon sorrowing, struggling, sinning humanity and was moved with compassion for the contrary sheep-like creatures he he had made in spite of the tremendous personal cost it would entail to himself to deliver them from their dilemma 
He chose deliberately to descend and live among them, <clears throat> amongst them, that he might deliver them. This meant laying aside his splendor, his position, his prerogatives as the perfect and faultless one. He knew he would be exposed to terrible privation, to ridicule, to false accusations, to rumor, gossip, to malici malicious charges that branded him as a glutton, a drunkard, friend of sinners, and even an imposter. It entailed losing his reputation. It would involve physical suffering, mental anguish, and spiritual agony. In short, his coming to earth as Messiah, as Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, was a straightforward case of utter self-sacrifice that culminated in the cross at Calvary. The laid down life, the poured out blood, were the supreme symbols of total selflessness. This was love. This was God. This was divinity in action, delivering men from their own utter selfishness, their own stupidity, their own suicidal instincts as lost sheep, unable to help themselves. In all of this, there is an amazing mystery. No man will ever be able to fully fathom its implications. It is bound up inexor inexorably with the concept of God's divine love of self-sacrifice, which is so foreign to most of us who are so self-centered. At best, we can only grasp feebly the incredible concept of a perfect person. A sinless one being willing, being willing actually to be made sin that we who are so of faults, selfish, selfish self-assertion and suspicion might be set free from sin and self to a new life, free, fresh, abundant life of righteousness. Yeshua told us himself that he had come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Just as the sheepman is thrilled beyond words to see his sheep thriving on the high, rich summer range, so my shepherd is so immensely pleased when he sees me flourish on the tablelands of a noble, lofty life that he has made possible for me. Part of the mystery and wonder of Calvary, of God's love to us in Messiah, is bound up too with the deep desire of his heart to have me live on a higher plane. He longs to see me living above the mundane level of common humanity. He is so pleased when I walk in the ways of holiness, of selflessness, of serene contentment in his care, aware of his presence and enjoying the intimacy of his companionship. To live thus is to live richly. To walk here is to walk with quiet assurance. To feed here is to be replete with good things. To find this table land is to have found something of my shepherd's love for me. We will continue with the last part of this series next week. Uh, we will be doing part four. Please don't forget if you haven't already, um, comment with your name down below letting me know if you want to be entered for the book giveaway. I have four of these books to give away. Okay. I have four. I'm going to be drawing names like I used to do in the past. I'll be drawing a name. Uh, four names. I already have a list going. Let me know if you would like to me like me to have uh, put your name down for the book giveaway. And I will go ahead and add you to the list. My prayer for you this Shabbat is that you stay as close to the shepherd as you possibly can. For we know that the days are short and the enemy does prowl around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. And the closer you are to the shepherd, the safer you are. 
I pray this in Yeshua's name and I pray that you have a blessed Shabbat. Amen and amen. And I will see you next week. I'll actually see you Tuesday. Shabbat Shalom.